play are that it's extravagant and it's sociable. Those are the two things that absolutely define play for us. It's always taking risks and solving them, I and mean, then with, with pleasure. If it gets too difficult, then it, it's not so much fun. But the most important thing is that it has these two aspects, that it is creative and that it is social. And I'm going to show you that that's very strongly part of what we know it already, but if I'm interested in exploring the extent to which a baby is born with musicality. Now, I think we have to be a bit careful because we live in a very technological culture. We have to be careful that, music, that we don't get the idea that music is what can be recorded and played, it, played back. I mean, all of you will know that music has to be part of activity, actual human body movement. And uh, I think that has led us to a concept which we call motor intelligence. And we think that a baby has motor intelligence as a fetus. And we can prove this by looking at the way the movements of the body of the fetus are intentional and coordinated and sensitive to the mother's movement to, a, to an extent, even in mid-gestation. There's an astonishing study of twins showing that when fetal twins in mid-gestation touch each other, the movement they make to touch the other is more careful than any movement they make to touch themselves, with one exception. The only movement that, for touching themselves that is done with equal care is touching the eyes. At this stage in development, the eyes are sealed shut, but they know they've got to be careful. And this proof, which comes from very close analysis of the dynamics of the movement, they call wired to be social. Now, I don't like the metaphor, but the idea is that even a bit people uh, maybe knows that another individual requires a different kind of approach on the self. So they have that knowledge. Okay, well, I'll just get on with it. And, um, the two things that I mentioned about play and sociality, I want to tell you, don't bother to take notes of the text, because I'm going to make a PDF of everything. You'll get all these slides, and I'm going to go very quickly through the slides, because I have to give you 200. Um, <laughs> but I want to show you the results, so I want to spend time on that. So it's sharing, moving to the coordination and sharing. This, no, no, go back. Not <laughs> this baby is on the first day, and just look at that intelligence and the interest, looking at the mother who is taking the photograph while the baby is lying on the father's arm. Now, um, Next picture shows the same baby on day four with a posture like St. John the Baptist. <laughs> the thing that's important is that the right hand is held up to give a message and the left hand is towards herself. That's a very common posture. <coughs> it's true of young babies even if they're going to become left-handed. That the right hand is more expressive or demonstrative. The left hand seems to be more concerned with self-regulation and sensitivity. Um, that's a, a complex. I'm not going to talk about the brain today, but it correlates with a lot of new brain science and new understanding of the emotional and <coughs> sensitive brain. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show the cell. Uh,
said that. So that um, illustrates the power of the baby's intention to communicate, the complexity of the expression of the face. She's not waving her right arm, arm about, but she could be. And she also says something that is not allowed. I mean, she can't pronounce consonants at this age, but she does. And um, her mother is being taught by her. And we found, next slide, we found this to be the rule of the world. No, no, next slide, next slide. <laughs> And he spent the last part of it, he's still 90, 96 when he's still teaching and writing. Um, he has spent a lot of the last decades of his life emphasizing the importance of narrative uh, for everything we do. And um, I recommend his thinking because he's actually applied it in law. He's in, in lecturing in law uh, at uh, New York University. And he's taught teaching lawyers to listen to each other and real, uh, to understand that every legal case, every trial, every um, legal squabble is one story versus another. They're both stories. Neither of them is totally true. And it's the negotiation of stories that is the importance of, of the legal process. Now, I'll, I'll skip. Uh, I want to mention uh, because he is one of the creators of modern neurophysiology, but I can mention on him now. Uh, he gave me a trip of lectures in the 40s in um, Edinburgh, and the title of his book was Man on His Nature. And he came to the conclusion, there's a lot of rich material in there. Um, he came to the conclusion that the important thing about development is imaginative creativity. He said that the development of a fertilized egg into a human being, he said to Mr. Brown or Mrs. Smith, it must be an act of imagination. It can't be an act of memory, because how can you remember something you never did? It has to be an act of imaginative creativity. And I think that principle is very important. You know, in a technical age, we need to think that we're manufactured, but we're not. We self-create, and we self-create our relationships as well. Yeah? And this is that the ancestral, it would be imagination of the memory, and so on. You see now, you, you can check these texts later. And Nikolai Bernstein, a Russian, looked into the way body movements were actually made in the 1930s. He got into collision with, with uh, Pavlov. And he didn't agree with Pavlov's thinking. Next. He showed by careful measurement, that body movements are made with perfect efficiency. There's no waste energy. Now, I want you to just reflect on something uh, later, because we haven't got time now. But I can walk across the room, and you don't hear anything. If a car drives down the road, you hear something. It wastes energy. When, a, when an animal body moves, it doesn't waste any energy. So you sign. Trees grow silently. They don't waste energy. We make sound in order to communicate. We make a lot of sound, as you are about to demonstrate later. But, um, this is done deliberately to make our inner process of creativity in movement accessible to other people and its qualities, you know, whether it is confident or not, and so on, and do it. Tennis player has to move her own body, all this very heavy body, in an efficient way, and intercept the ball with perfect prediction. This is creativity. That's what we're moving animals have to be creative the whole time. Next. This is a good example of this. The woman has uh, got to land on two feet without falling over. She jumps in the air. She accelerates and then comes down slowly and lands perfectly. How can she do that when she's not touching anything? She changes the mechanics of her body 
When she pulls her legs up, she spins faster, and when she sticks them out straight, she goes slowly down and lands comfortably. So she has control over the dynamics within her body. We do that every time we do anything. And next. This is a good record that we're doing. It's a philosopher talking about movement. This is the fetus I was talking about, sucking its thumb. And but this is the age when the brain is very, very developed. But it's a human brain with human motor intelligence already. Next. And all the parts that are needed for a conversation, like that pen we got, are already there, even before the nervous system is connected to them. The eyes, the mouth, the ears, inner ear, and so on. And the hand. Yes. Now, this is Jan Kanser, another person I want to emphasize. He knows more about the emotional system of the brain than anybody. He studies them in rats, because he thinks rats are very like people. And he studies laughter in rats. And he shows the young rats when you tickle them, giggle. And they like other rats to giggle easily. <laughs> See? You always laugh when I say that. You said you always laugh when I say that. And it makes it friendly. That's what laughter is for in birds or mammals. And um, he says that the brain stem underneath the cerebral cortex is a primary affect of consciousness. And it determines what you are conscious of, and what you remember, and what you evaluate, and so forth. And you need that in order to communicate, because you have to communicate purposefulness and emotional value in everything that you do when you're in the communication. If what we see in those pictures is the mother is imitating the baby. The, the attitude and expression of the baby is being mirrored or imitated by the mother. And that was an astonishing observation which made us realize that the baby was much more in control than anyone had thought. We did this independently of Mary Catherine Bateson and Daniel Stern was doing similar things in New York at the same time. It was a discovery, totally independent discovery of the three of us, that there was a scientific field of research that was very rich studying mother infant communication or mother com or baby communication with anybody. It had never been properly studied. Some philosophers, Rousseau, for example, had talked about it, um, about the ability of babies to communicate. <coughs> but nobody had actually done any work on it because scientists thought, oh, it's ridiculous. Babies don't have any brains. They don't have a self-concept. How can they possibly communicate? <laughs> she did something no one had ever done before. All the psychologists that had studied newborn imitation, including Andy Meltzer, who made himself very famous, um, were interested in getting a publication. They wanted to prove babies could imitate, and that was it. They didn't ask why. Now, Emma, she was a more imaginative. She was working with a mythologist. She wanted to know what was the purpose of imitation. So once she'd got the baby to imitate, many kinds of actions she got, she stopped and just looked at the baby. I can't do it. The baby stared at her like you're doing, and then repeated it to get her to imitate. And she called that provocation. So she proved that the reason babies imitate is to get a dialogue. They don't want to learn a stupid act like tongue protrusion or mouth opening. They want to share something that you have thought of. You offer it to them, and they want to offer it back to you to see if they can share it. And she found that the heart accelerates just before imitating because the baby has to do something that is difficult, it's never done before. When the baby pays attention and provocates just before the movement, the baby's heart decelerates because when you pay attention, your heart slows down. So she proved that it not only is it dialogical, but it's emotional. <coughs> There's an emotional involvement 